This is World War II, Lesson 3, The Enemy of Your Enemy. Dun, dun, dun. So what you're looking at is a, a picture from uh, the D-Day invasion that we'll get into in a little bit. Um, you can see these landing crafts that the, uh, our soldiers are in and, and as they're hiding, uh, as they approach the beaches of uh, Normandy, uh, France. And uh, we'll, we'll explain what that was about in an upcoming slide. So what good leaders do, I'm not saying what good people do, because Joe Stalin, it's hard to argue Joe Stalin was a good guy. But it's hard to argue that he wasn't a good leader. Um, Joe Stalin was certainly a good leader, even though his 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 methods were at times um, violent and and um, intimidating. And and some you know he the people they both loved him and feared him. There's a fine line between that between those two things. But Joe Stalin, as 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 a leader. Is going to look beyond victory. That's what good leaders do. They're always looking, you know, beyond what they're at right now. They're they're trying to think a couple steps ahead. Now we were helping out Joe Stalin. Um, his you know crimes and you know, the millions that he's going to be responsible for killing. That we don't know anything about that stuff just yet. We won't find that out for another 10, 15 years. Um, but we were. If you remember from the uh, previous lesson, we have teamed up with the Soviet Union. The enemy of your enemy is your friend. And we've been sending aid, okay, food, guns, supplies, whatever he needs over to help out uh, Joe Stalin over in the Soviet Union. And FDR was even calling him Uncle Joe in, in uh, conversation and speeches that he made. Um, part of the reason was to try to get the American people to buy into the idea that, that it's okay to, to be friends with communists. That's going to come back to bite people later on. But for now, um, it, the enemy of your enemy, your enemy is your friend. So um, the stuff that we're going to be sending over, like I said, medical supplies, um, planes, weapons, food, supplies that are going to help the uh, Soviet Union fighting against the Nazis and Adolf Hitler. Now, he needs some help, though. If you remember, Hitler has kind of marched through Eastern or Western Europe. He, he's taken France. He uh, beat up uh, Britain uh, to, to a degree where, where they need to recover for a while before they can really get back in the fight. So there isn't really much of a Western front going on right now. We are working on the Pacific and going after the Japanese, but we've also started to send uh, ships across the Atlantic Ocean. This will become known as the Battle of the Atlantic, where we're going to send our guys and our supplies over to, to England. And we're going to organize and try to figure out what we want to do in terms of how we're going to get involved in England. Stalin is getting very impatient because he's kind of taken the brunt of the Nazi military on the Soviet Union. So the Nazis and the Soviets are beating each other up over in, in the Soviet Union. And uh, Stalin is looking for us and the British and the French to reopen fighting in the Western Front. This would then split the um, Nazi army and uh, force them to fight a war on two fronts, like we talked about with World War I. So here's, just to give you an example, so again, here's Nazi Germany here. And they have taken over pretty much all of everything that's purple or light purple it is all under the control of Adolf Hitler. And he's marched into the Soviet Union. Like he's, he's moved in uh, past what you can see here. So he has control over everything that's purple or light purple. All except for Switzerland here, who's remaining neutral, as they normally do in war. Uh, Britain, who's uh, you know the good guy. Uh, good guys team. Um, Ireland is on that team. You can see Ireland right there. So um, he hasn't gotten Britain. He hasn't taken Switzerland because they're neutral. Um, and uh, he's got all this other stuff. So the Soviets are fighting the Nazis back over here somewhere over in this side. And he's asking us to open up a front over in France somewhere 
so that the Nazi army it has to go fight over here and over here just to split their, their strength and give the Soviet Union a chance. The battle that becomes uh, known as like the turning point of, uh, of the war, especially on that Eastern front for the Soviet Union, is the Battle of Stalingrad. All, all major wars have what, they, what seems to be a, a turning point. Sometimes that turning point is obvious at the time it happens. Sometimes it's looking back at, at the end of the war and, and you can kind of see that moment where the, the tide turned and the momentum switched to the other side. Stalingrad was that, was that situation. Um, this is a, a city that, that Joe Stalin, it would, used to be Leningrad, and Joe Stalin then changed the name and named it after himself to Stalingrad. And he was not going to lose the city that he named after himself. So he basically told his soldiers, you will fight for every brick of this city. Um, you will move forward. You will never retreat. If you retreat, you will be shot if you retreat. I mean, this is pretty nasty stuff. So this six months of fighting over every brick of the city of Stalingrad um, is going to be uh, huge. And you can see uh, there's the city of Stalingrad there um, where the... Uh, Soviets and the Nazis are, are going to be, you know, picking each other off from high points in those buildings where they have snipers. Um, it's just going to be an all-out war over, like I said, every brick of the city. Um, now, again, the Soviets will be better prepared to fight in the elements of uh, of Russia and its winter, the Soviet Union and its winter. Um, whereas the uh, and apparently the Soviets also have the ability to walk on air. You can see that there. It's kind of cool. Um, but uh, the Nazis are going to have a hard time when it gets cold in the in the uh, Soviet winter in Moscow. So um, the Soviets do win that battle, and uh, like I said, it kind of turns the, the tide of things going on in the East. But he's still looking for us to get involved in the West. The big three. The big three uh, at this point are the leaders of the United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union. Franklin Roosevelt, the United States, Winston Churchill, Great Britain, and Joseph Stalin, Soviet Union, are going to have a number of big meetings um, where they're going to uh, look at, you know, how they're going to fight this thing and then what the world's going to look like when the war is over. So they're going to meet, uh, they've met before, but this is like one of the first big ones that they that's worth talking about for us, at least. They meet in Tehran, Persia, which is today in Iran, in 1943. And we're the three best friends that anybody could have. We're the three best friends that anyone could have. We're the three best friends that anyone could have. And we'll never, never, ever, ever, ever leave each other. So um, you can see Stalin on the left, Churchill on the right, and uh, FDR in the middle. Now, again, FDR can't walk. So uh, he's been put in that chair uh, basically, you know, before media was brought in, anybody could take a picture. Uh, and then uh, Stalin and Churchill were brought in with him. Um, I'm not sure why they can't find three matching chairs. Uh, Stalin looks like he's got kind of a swivel going on there. FDR looks like he's at like a good desk, solid desk or dining room table chair. And uh, Churchill looking frumpy again uh, in a very, like, very comfortable, uh, like, lounging chair from, like, a living room or some, something. I don't know what's going on here. Well, we have a problem. Um, while the meeting's going on in Tehran, it turns out that Joseph Stalin has bugged the embassy. He's actually listening in. He, he knew what they were saying when they were in front of him. He wants to know what they're saying when they're not. Um, so he had conversations bugged so that he could listen to what was being said when he wasn't around. Um, so this is just an example. You're going to see a lot of examples like this where Joseph Stalin is very, very sneaky. And we have certainly underestimated his sneakiness. We're still calling him Uncle Joe. We still trust this guy. We still think he's doing all right. Um, in the end, he's been, uh, like I said, looking down the road and, and he wants to know what's being said when he's not there. And he's going to use that information against us at times. At the meeting, one of the things, the biggest thing that came out of um, the Tehran meeting uh, that's, you know, for us right now, uh, 
is that they agreed that post-war Eastern Europe would be a Soviet zone of influence. What that means is, you can see here's the Soviet Union over here. It's huge, right? Um, and then you have <clears throat> East Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia. Well, this is what it's going to be. East Germany doesn't exist technically just yet. We'll get, we'll get there. But this is going to serve as kind of a buffer between Western Europe over here and Eastern in, and the Soviet Union. Um, Stalin knows that every time the Soviet Union's been attacked, it's been attacked through, well, well, actually mostly through Poland right here because it's kind of easy to get right through. It's very flat. There's nothing really stopping anybody from, from just kind of walking right through. But this is the attack route that has threatened the Soviet Union over, over history. So he is setting this up as, as like a buffer zone. Uh, he's going to call them his satellite nations uh, where he's going to have, he's going to have control over who's leading and uh, the, they're, they're going to have communist governments um, so that uh, he can work with them. So uh, that's the big thing that comes out of the Tehran meeting is that, that he's going to have uh, kind of a puppet tier control, like, you know, of these puppet governments. And Poland is given a slice of Eastern Germany. That's going to be, that's part of the deal. That gives them access again to the, uh, to the waterways which helps them with their trade. All right, so here it comes. Um, three years after Pearl Harbor has been hit and Germany declares war on us, we finally show up in, in Western Europe. Now we've been, we've won the Battle of the Atlantic. Basically that means that we've, we've gotten a bunch of, of supplies and, and soldiers, um, weapons all across the Atlantic Ocean to England where we've reorganized, we've come up with a plan and now it's time to execute the plan. We're going to storm the beaches of Normandy, which is part of France. And um, you can see better from this map, you can see, you know, we're going to leave different ports with the British and what's left of, Fr of French soldiers. And we're going to uh, meet up and then we're going to storm these beaches right here in, in what is Nazi controlled uh, France. So we're looking to storm the beaches so that um, so, so basically What's going to happen is over, we're going to storm the beaches first thing in the morning, the first light in the morning. And, and uh, the night before, we're going to hit with, you know, with bombs from the air. So we're going to use the bombs to try to loosen up that area, try to make sure that the, so the Nazis can't fight back very, you know, with all their best stuff. Like we want to try to take out their weapons, their ability to stop us from getting up on the beaches. This was actually supposed to happen on June 5th, 1944. Um, but uh, because of bad weather, uh, this 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 body of water, this is the English Channel right here. This body of water gets very tough when there's storms that come through, and uh, it would have been very difficult for our ships to come through. So we delayed it a day till June 6th, and uh, the big ships came across in the, the early that morning, and uh, we tried to take the beaches. Uh, so these crafts, these are the landing crafts. These uh, are released from the big ships. And they're the ones who are going toward the beaches. So if you've ever seen the movie Saving Private Ryan, and if you haven't seen the movie, you should see the movie. Uh, the opening 20 minutes to Saving Private Ryan is this moment where we're storming the beaches of Normandy. This is going to be a very bloody situation. The, the, the water of the English Channel is going to be blood red uh, by the time this is done. Uh, because uh, I think we lose like 14,000 soldiers. Uh, in, the, in the, attempting to storm these beaches. Now we do win the beach. <clears throat> and you can see these guys, this is after the invasion has, has already happened because uh, they certainly wouldn't be walking off and looking at cameras. Uh, it, they'd be ducking for cover as quick as possible if they were being shot at. But this is why, this is why we're storming the beaches. We needed to get control of the beaches because we had to bring our ships in that had all the equipment on it. And it's got our, our tanks and our Jeeps and and uh, guns, you know, all the different things that we're going to need to try to push back the Nazis and get them out of France. 
So uh, these ships, you can see they're, they're actually like beached. They're actually like we brought them in on the water when the tide was up. Um, and then when the tide went out, we can then open up the back of the ship and let everything out, like drive our stuff right out of there. So this is why um, you can see all the ships in the water there. And so now what we've done is we've taken these beaches and now we can start moving forward into France. You can see the cover of the New York Times, Allies, Allied Armies, the Allies, that's the good guys, uh, land in France. Uh, the Great Invasion is underway. Well, you can see there's the D-Day invasion. You can see how much was actually brought in. Uh, we, we brought 130,000 soldiers in when we stormed the beaches. Um, total invasion troops was 153,000. Uh, but the same, the soldiers that we landed on the beaches and uh, they survived it and then were able to move forward, um, 130,000. You see 120 warships, 3,500 troop carriers came in. Uh, an unbelievable uh, achievement to, uh, to take these beaches. So this is the thing that Stalin had been waiting for and, and begging for. And there's some people who believe that, that we were in no hurry to get into, into France, um, that General Eisenhower and, and uh, our leadership over, and General Marshall, um, our leadership over in, uh, in England, had kind of taken our time to get in there. And at first, because we wanted to come up with the best possible plan to ensure the most possible success. But also at the same time, we were kind of okay with the, uh, and this, this kind of sounds dirty, but it, we were kind of okay letting the Nazis and the, the Soviets beat the crap out of each other, kill each other, um, so that when this war is over, we can maybe assume uh, a superpower uh, situation. So Stalin starts moving from the east. Remember, he had his big win in Stalingrad, so he's got some momentum building over in the east, and now we're working our way in the west, and we're working with uh, what's left of the French army and uh, the British, and we're, we're, you know, here come the Americans. <laughs> 